Well, Mr. Waterford and ladies and gentlemen, that's a magnificent, felicitous introduction. I never expected to hear language of that character in the Senate. <laughs> Beyond that, I never expected language of that character to come from a newspaper editor. <laughs> so the millennium is indeed arriving, and I'm under obligation to you. I would only hope that those words have been appropriately taped because they can be used on uh, other occasions. And other occasions. Well, yes, I am open to any amendment. Now, it's true that I was uh, referred to as the member for Morteen in another place, in the, the Senate. Uh, not in the Senate, but in the House of Representatives. That was by the then member for East Sydney, Eddie Ward. After having mixed it with Ward, I would describe contemporary political practitioners as a collection of Lord Fauntleroy's. <laughs> Ward said when he first saw the member for Morteen, he didn't know whether he was a junior Adolf or a filleted prawn. <laughs> now, the magnificent obloquy. And I was to say, by way of gentle response, that I'm told that the honourable gentleman is tough. I'd like him to know in the outer bar coup he wouldn't be regarded as respectable crowbait. <laughs> I, I, looking back, I probably owe my life to Ward. I rarely interjected, and if anybody interjected against me, well, too bad. And Tom Muren, for whom I have both affection and admiration, I unhesitatingly describe him as the only genuine pacifist I've ever met. But he interjected one day and I said, oh, the Honourable Member for Reed, this is the ex-heavyweight boxer. He's been knocked out so often they've sold the advertising rights <laughs> to the soles of his feet. <laughs> and he's coming over to punch me with a hand on him like a ham. And Eddie Ward stopped him. He said, he dishes it out and he takes it. You learn to do the same. So there it is. And um, listening to you, Mr... Chairman reminds me of another Ward story. Ward uh, sat next to um, Arthur Cole in the House. Uh, Ward was uncompromising in all of his parliamentary dealing. Indeed, I can hear in this place Richard Gardner Casey saying to me one day, I don't understand it, Jim. Ward stops and talks to you. He's never spoken to me in 30 years. <laughs> But uh, there, there it was. Ward uh, said to uh, Arthur Colwell one day when Sir Robert Menzies was making a condolence speech. Now, Menzies' speech-making uh, capability to me was singular. He disliked, and for proper reasons, any description of him being as an orator. But he was, to me, quite the finest advocate to whom I have ever listened. I've said of him he could turn a Sayo Biscuit into a Lamington. <laughs> he was indeed immensely persuasive. He was superb in making a condolence speech. Now, they're not easy to make in Parliament about somebody who's left the world. And Ward, one day when uh, Sir Robert was making a speech as Prime Minister, turned to Arthur Cole and said, When I go, I want none of this. I oh, said, Arthur, what do you want? I just want me to get up and say, he was loved by all. <laughs> when Ward left the world, Sir Robert made a, I thought, a very beautiful speech. I can see the scene now. I walked out the side door like that sometime afterwards. And I said, I don't wish to be presumptuous, Prime Minister. And he looked at me. Oh, as much as to say, this is a strange role for you. <laughs> But given the exchanges that you and Ward had over the years, that was a very beautiful speech. How do you do it? He tossed his head and said, killing every human being in this world has some redeeming feature. I suspect if we worked at it long enough, we'd find one in you. <laughs> so I'm under obligation to you. Now, Mr Chairman, I, I sat in this building with 12 of the 25 Australians who either 
had been Prime Minister, were to occupy the position of Prime Minister, or were to hold the office of Prime Minister. Twelve of the 25. I don't put that uh, down to any accomplishment on my part. I put it down to raging good luck. <laughs> and I complain from time to time that it's a great pity that some of that good fortune can't accompany me onto the racetrack. <laughs> but there it was. They were all different and all remarkable people, all interesting people. And the leaders of the opposition, some who never went beyond the position of leader of the opposition, although holding ministerial office. Arthur Cole, Dr Evatt, uh, Bill Sledden, of course, uh, all of them had held ministerial posts. Arthur Cole will fascinate me, and for a variety of reasons. I credit him with what is, to me, the finest rejoinder in political literature, I venture to say, certainly in this country, and if I may presume, I'd go further, one of the finest known to the English language. One of the members had a crack at his voice. Arthur, as a kid, he had suffered from laryngeal diphtheria. It affected his voice. Very dangerous to have a crack at a person's appearance, nose, bald head, or whatever the case may be. You can go for your life with the imperfections, as far as I'm concerned. Arthur said, I can't help my voice. It's what God and nature have given me, but unlike the honourable gentleman, it is an Australian voice. It's not a mixture of Oxford, affectation and adenoids. <laughs> <laughs> Live that down, if you may. I suppose I would be one of the few high Tories of the Anglican Church, and I'm high Tory in politics, the secular and the ecclesiastical field. I hope my distinguished friend and colleague, Mr Cowan, will remark on the consistency of performance there. <laughs> Whoever discussed the resurrection with Arthur Cole? Arthur was an intensely religious man. He went to Mass every day. And with great respect, Mr Waterford, to you and your former colleagues in this place, here and elsewhere, nobody in the gallery ever picked it. Significant to me. He only wore one tie, a black tie. He'd lost a kitty in tragic circumstances. He never recovered from it. I enjoyed his company uh, immensely. His wit was uh, constant. He took his party through very difficult days indeed. And of course, I saw all of it. And the same with uh, Dr. Evatt. Uh, he was indeed, as Leslie Halen described him, like a summer storm. I recently stirred myself by reading Barry Cohen's maiden speech. Oh, he had some harsh things to say about yours truly. <laughs> and I hope he'll take this occasion to use it as the forum for an appropriate apology. <laughs> because he said of John Gordon, when I was made the Minister for the Navy, he said, just imagine what the people of the emerging countries of Africa and Asia will think of the new Minister for the Navy. I listened to that language. I thought it was, uh, well, a little unwholesome. It roused me. It made me emotional. And I've been trying to recover from it ever since. <laughs> I thought the Navy was a magnificent service. Indeed, it was left to the Navy, to a member of the Navy, to bestow upon me the finest credential that I've ever encountered. On board the aircraft carrier, these were the splendid days when we did have one. <laughs> I had a pair of overalls on being shown around the engine room by a young commander engineer caught up with the valve hissing off, and the stoker came up. I said, how do you do? What's your name, O'Neill? What's your name, Killen? What do you do? Well, I said, as a matter of fact, I happen to be the minister. Smart bastard. <laughs> I thought it was a splendid assessment. <laughs> My late friend Fred Daly said it was grossly exaggerated. <laughs> but I kept my eye on that uh, stoker. I thought if any man was destined to become chief of the naval staff, he was. But uh, it was not to be. But then I was relieved of the post of Minister for the Navy 
by a Prime Minister to whom you uh, referred, the Right Honourable William McMahon. Uh, I suppose it's been written about appropriately, but it deserves to be given a flourish of theatre. I went to see him and the conversation went in this fashion. Oh. <laughs> <coughs> Oh, I can't leave you at the Navy. Oh, I said, I've been reading that all over the weekend. Oh, are those naughty, naughty papers? Well, I said, you know, this was a fierce attack on the Fourth Estate. Right? <laughs> oh, I wanted to tell it to you in private. Well, I said, uh, I'm very sorry I was getting on well with the Navy. Why? Oh, you can't ask that question. But I said, there's any reason why you want me out. Oh, yes, I want you white out. Well, I said, is there anything else you'd like me to do? No, I want you white, white out. Well, I said, is there any reason for that? Well, I told you before, you can't ask those naughty questions. <laughs> well, I said, I insist on asking them, Prime Minister. You can ask them, but I'm not going to answer them. <laughs> well, I said on that felicitous note, good morning. <laughs> and I left. I offer the view, looking back, there's no sense of bitterness, because we're going to spend a bit of time in eternity I said, um, uh, probably I would not have held the seat, my seat of Morteen, if I had stayed as a, as a member of his government, but there it was. But I come to the final touch when he came to me years later and he said, I can't possibly hold my seat. Well, I said, things are a bit rough, Bill, but they're not that bad. All his fair weather friends had left him. This is one of the distinguishing constant features of political endeavour. The friends come and go. <laughs> and more particularly in those who say, Jim, you know, we're right behind you. <laughs> you want to know precisely where they are <laughs> and what they are accoutred with too. <laughs> oh, I can't possibly hold my seat. Well, I said things are a bit tough anyhow to cut a long story short. I opened his campaign in the Concord Church Hall. Mainly party faithful there, but happily a few drunks to make things interesting. I do not deny that I've had significant differences of opinion with my right honourable friend. But I'm here, ladies and gentlemen, to get him back to his proper place, back into the parliament of the country. And this is cheered and applauded by the party faithful. Billy. Oh, I've made some dreadful mistakes in my time, and oh, some of them I really and truly regret. But the worst mistake I ever made was in 1971, I didn't make Jim Killen the Attorney General. I said, that's the year you sacked me. <laughs> I know it's puzzled and irritated people on both sides of the divide, the friendships that I've had on both sides. I don't know of any two in this building who tried to insult each other, as Fred Daly and I did. I don't know of any two who are closer friends. I tell people to this day that I still talk with Fred. I use the celestial internet. <laughs> and I'm still getting the advice from him, the advice to the effect the man who christened me, Archdeacon Francis Knight, who gave me the advice when he prepared his first sermon. The tutor said to him, Knight, this is magnificent stuff. You really do understand the life of St Paul. Got to the door of the study. Knight, may I make a suggestion to you about your sermon? Of course, sir, what is it? Cut it in half, and it doesn't greatly matter which half you leave out. <laughs> and Daly would say to me, remember the advice given to you by the archdeacon. Well, Daly and his dog, Sir John, both applied to join my staff. I put the dog on the staff, <laughs> contending that it had superior literacy skills. <laughs> with uh, Fred, the same with uh, Goff. Uh, we spent four days together recently in Western Australia. I told the group of, of people that we were accompanying, or they were accompanying us, whichever you were disposed to describe it in fashion, that we were there to sort out each other's heresies. I contended that he was in possession of far more than I was. But you can say these extravagant things, you can't justify them. <laughs> but uh, my mind went back when Barry mentioned his name. Uh, when Rex Xavier Connor left the world, the parliament was sitting and the Labour Party 
had a ballot as to who the mourners would be. And the funeral was being held at Wollongong, severe limitations on the type of aircraft that could land and take off from Wollongong. And Clyde Cameron came to me. I keep in regular touch with him, my old 86-year-old, he'll screw me for having mentioned that age, orthodox socialist who encouraged from me the words some years ago now that the economic rationalists are driving me into the arms of Karl Marx. <laughs> he said, we always knew we'd get you. <laughs> he came into my office, I was at Defence, you'd have sworn it was a Dickensian solicitor reading a will. I want to go to the funeral. Oh, I said, steady on, old pal, I'll get you a brandy. I don't want any drink. I want to go to the funeral. Oh, I said, please, let me get you a brandy. No, it'll be the late Mr Connor's wish. I'll be with him at the end. Oh, I said, please, uh, you know, you put me in a dreadful position. I don't want to upset Goff. The voice of a Dickensian solicitor disappeared and back came the authentic voice of the shearing shed. And he tendered very robust advice as to what Goff's fate should be <laughs> and stalked out the door. I dropped a note to Goff. I always went to his office. And I told my staff that I'd be away for 10 minutes with Mr uh, Whitlam. The door came open, in came the great figure. This morbid bloody Labour Party will be the end of me. Well, I said, I don't know what to do. You've never been reluctant to advise us in the past. <laughs> I said, really and truly, I, I don't want to upset uh, Clyde. And he tendered very robust advice as to what Clyde's fate should be. <laughs> I said, what an extraordinary coincidence. <laughs> I said, what do you want to happen when you die? He paused for about five seconds. Comrade, I just want you to get up and say, let the Senate be his pyre. <laughs> Cameron got to Wollongong to the funeral. He went down on the 748 with uh, my right honourable friend Douglas Anthony. And I keep in touch with Gough. Recently a Sydney, a Brisbane solicitor has said, have you had any work experience in mediation? I said, I am the mediator between the Honourable E.G. Whitlam and the Honourable C.R. Cameron. And I know of no other person in Australia who can act as mediator between those two. <laughs> On the mention of solicitors, I would leave you on this note, the capacity for insult or the habit still seems to follow me around. Recently I said to a young constable in a court case, come on constable, please, answer the question. You give me the impression of being intelligent. He said, if I weren't under oath, I'd return the compliment. 